Marie de France gets in on one of the most famous love stories of her day when she writes Chevre Foy. It's a treatment of the uh, Tristan and Isolde story. They were uh, quite popular of, uh, in the Middle Ages throughout this whole period. In the, uh, the Anglo-Norman tradition, you get writers like Berul and Thomas, and uh, we only have fragments of their stuff left, but you get much more uh, fuller treatment in some other stuff. Uh, a couple of years down the pike, you're gonna get a, uh, a great version in, out of Germany even. And the outlines of the story are really very well known. And uh, it is, King Mark is the king of England. He is housed in uh, in Cornwall. The uh, he is married to the much younger Isolde, queen, and uh, he has a nephew named Tristan. Tristan is a uh, a, a young, full-blooded uh, uh, boy man in the prime of his life and he is also a noted singer he is a bit of an artist in his own right a singer of perhaps lays he uh he develops a uh, a great talent for that and this story which is one of his uh which is one of marie de france's shortest i think it's the shortest in the whole collection of 12 uh, uh i think it's about 119 118 uh, lines really very short the regular octosyllabic uh couplets but very tight and she ignores most of the story most of the story of it uh, of uh tristan and isolde is pretty much known it's just, well you know people have done that and they know the background they're going to be familiar with it um and and she really focuses in on just a single little episode a tiny little anecdote within this broader story of uh of, of lovers uh star-crossed lovers and uh, what she does with it then is because it is so focused and it has such background familiarity that people are able to sort of buy in because they know the story so well, she's able to create great intensity around just this single little moment. It is a tour de force of composition uh, and poetic expression on a kind of uh, concision and concentration that is rare to find in the uh, in, in the Middle Ages and certainly going back in, in, into uh, even the ancient era. Uh, the, uh, the idea of doing this in narrative form is pretty bold because you could find that kind of focus and concision uh, and intensity in lyric poetry but to do it in a narrative form is you know this is this is her showing off i would say but in the story you have uh tristan who is uh um uh at this point uh, ostracized. He is cast out. Uh, of, uh, his, his love has been discovered and he is trying to find ways to contact his, uh, uh, his beloved. Uh, King Mark has figured out that something is going on. Uncle Mark is uh, starting to get wise. Uh, and uh, he is, uh, Tristan is now trying to communicate. He is uh, essentially wandered off but he's trying to communicate with uh with Isolde and he realizes that uh she is going to be uh passing by uh the woods where he has been essentially living he's living among nature he's living in a kind of arcadian uh not paradise but he is uh he is embedded in a kind of natural surroundings and you can make of that what you will but he comes up with this idea that he will uh carve uh he will carve his name in, uh, in, in, in a piece of wood that she will be able to see. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the translation here uh, uses the word he wrote his name. So it's not even just carving. They're being really quite explicit, uh, Marie de France is, um, with this, uh, this act that she will see it and recognize it as him. And, um, well, it works uh the, uh, they uh she passes by she sees it she gets out of her uh she gets out of her uh 
train, whatever the, uh, the, the thing, and they have a uh, they have a little afternoon delight, let's say, uh, off in the woods somewhere. Um, the the poem itself, the lay itself, makes a very explicit reference at one point uh, where where it really works in a uh, a simile that is uh, quite beautiful. With the two of them, it was just as it is with the honeysuckle that attaches itself to the hazel tree. When it is wound and attached and worked itself around the trunk, the two can survive together. But if someone tries to separate them, the hazel dies quickly and they honeysuckle with it. Sweet love, so it is with us. You cannot live without me, nor I without you. Interesting that they're explicitly finding a simile and saying, okay, now that's like us. And it's a beautiful little image of uh, uh, two, natural, uh, uh, two natural life forms uh, coexisting symbiotically and all of that. And if you try and rip them apart, they will die. I don't know if that's true with the plants, but uh, maybe, sure. Um, this is, of course, where you get the, the, the word chevrefoy, which means honeysuckle, we are told. Um, I believe the, uh, one of the English translation is goatweed or something like that, which is uh, much less, let's say, euphonious than uh, chevrefoy. Uh, goatweed doesn't really, you know, doesn't really do it for you. But the idea of art is significant here because this is the poem offering up a symbol, a metaphor, or not a metaphor, a simile of uh, to describe art. And the whole thing is really about art and writing. Uh, that is how Tristan reaches out and connects with uh, with Isolde. Uh, Isolde is never mentioned or is never named in this, by the way. It's a little curious why, you know, she is called the queen, but everybody knows who she is. But that notion of writing, that notion of connecting, which is just so curiously put throughout here, the idea of using a symbol, the artificiality of the symbol, the artificiality of writing itself. He communicates by carving his name on a piece of wood. Uh, all of this is suggesting the primacy and the central role of writing within their relationship itself. Their relationship is essentially built on words, on writing. And again, remember, Tristan is a poet. Tristan is a singer. Tristan is a musician. Tristan is a himself a symbol of literature, of art. And at the very end, then she departed, she felt her love, but when it came to separation, they began to weep. Tristan went to Wales to wait until his uncle sent for him. For the joy that he'd felt from his love when he saw her by means of the stick he inscribed as this queen has instructed, and in order to remember the words, Tristan, who played the harp well, composed a new lie about it, lay about it. I shall name it briefly. The English call it goat's leaf. The French call it chevrefoy. I have given you the truth about the lie that I have told here. Now, right there, okay, again, they're highlighting the translation issue, uh, the, uh, the, the, the French to English issue. Um, they're highlighting the, uh, the writing again, the inscription, the, uh, all of that. Uh, they're highlighting again his, his identity with, uh, with, the, uh, with the harp or the lyre, uh, the singing and the performing and the writing of art. The notion of art is all over this. It is being foregrounded in a very aggressive way for such a short piece of work. Why? The implication is that the art is almost more important than the love, or at least on the same level. In this, the act of love is then somehow equivalent to, or at least twined around, the act of writing. 
they're symbiotic, just like the hazel and the honeysuckle. Uh, they cannot exist without one another. The ability to communicate, the ability to express one's love, which is all that Tristan is trying to do at the very beginning. Expression, art, communication, writing. All of these things are wrapped together in this little puzzle that is the leg. To write, then, is to participate in an ideal. To write is to produce art, is to glimpse something perfect and try and bring it down for other people to experience. Marie de France, in the writing of the, uh, the Anglo-Norman uh, uh, late Middle Ages, is offering a view of art as a pathway to an ideal, as a way of participating in an ideal, and showing that love itself, human love, is a way of participating in that as well. And art and love are one and the same.